what, what does it say? What did, what did you guys come up with? Anyone? Maybe it is harder than I thought. Yes, Howard. Keep your eyes open, meaning? Okay. Watch your life, watch your relationships. I like that. Keep your eyes open. Douglas. Okay. Keep your eyes on God. Get your eyes off. Uh, you're going to, it's not going to fare well with you. Yeah. What else? Any other thoughts? Huh? Victoria. Yeah, throw her under the bus, why don't you? Yeah, she wants to enjoy her latte. Not <laughs> there you go. I like that. That's good. Anyone else? One other. Pride. Who said that? All right. You want to you wanna tease that out a little bit for us? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's good. Those are all great answers. I mean, you look at that. And I think, too, the, the danger is, and I think what was behind everything you all said was how we look at other people, you know, and how we size ourselves up. Uh, because we're always going to look good compared to someone else who's worse than us. Amen? When, Bri when Ryan was leading communion, <laughs> you know, he said, you know, no, I'm the most wretched sinner. And there's some people that say, yeah, you are the most wretched. Not, not that I am, but you are, right? And um, I, I was reminded this week of the, um, the, the news story of that pastor who took his own life last week. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, here is a fellow pastor, someone who is in the trenches of ministry like myself, who was called, who has chosen this as a vocation, and all of a sudden, the, the person that you thought least likely to, to stumble, to trip up, to fall, to make a poor choice, whatever you want to call it, does it, and, and it really rattles our, our world. And says, you know, we expect the rock star to, to end their own life. You expect the, the, the fallen Hollywood actress or actor to maybe do it. Some politician, but a pastor? And, and we don't understand why someone who loves Jesus and tells people about Jesus and teaches people about Jesus, how, how does this happen? And I sit there and go, because the reality of it is this. We are no different as shepherds than the sheep that we pastor. We struggle with the same stuff. We go through the same irritations of life and struggle through the same trivialities of everyday existence. And yeah, we get in fights with our wives, and we, we treat our children horribly sometimes, and some of us get tick speeding tickets and, you know, other stuff like that. And, you know, there's this reality that we are all human. We all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. And no one in this room has any right to point their finger at somebody else and say, what a loser you are. You know, I'm better than you. I mean, the reality of it is this. We all should be humbled by the fact that there's a God who chooses to love us. And if we truly understand ourselves, that love of God surely can't fall on a life like mine. But it does. This is the beauty and this is the, the miraculous, wonderful nature of God who chooses to love us in spite of our wretched sinfulness. And I pray for that family of that pastor. And I pray for other pastors as well. And I thank you for your prayers for me because none of us are beyond the struggles. And none of us are beyond the temptations. And none of us are beyond having to experience the, the wrestling that exists within all of our hearts. And that is the struggle, isn't it, in all of our journey with Jesus. It's the struggle between sin and grace. It's the struggle going, how do I present myself as human and yet, how do I also guide us in the truth and, and hold these things in tension and, and only by the grace of God am I able to do that? Amen? And so 
we come to a passage in Genesis 9 where we see a, a righteous man fall. And not only a righteous man fall, but even those of his own household approach his fallen state with, with such different responses. And I sit there and ask myself, God, what would you have us know today? That as we struggle in this life with both virtues and vices, there's a God who can carry us through even when we experience the most critical of failures. So turn your Bibles to Genesis 9. Open your notes so we can look at this. So there's two things we're going to focus on today. There's going to be the lessons from failure. And then there's the lessons for triumph. How can we learn from our past and our, and our struggles and our mistakes? And, and how does God want to set us up and position us for an even better future? Because the one thing I want you to know is that none of our failures are final or fatal or fearful. Okay? Those are not, that's bonus points right there for you guys, all right? Those are, those are things that we see throughout Scripture. And here's what I love about the Bible, is it that it shows us great men and women of faith as, as honest people that they are, right? It, Christianity and the Bible is the only book in the world con containing information about this religion we call Christianity that gives us the good and the bad of its characters. You go to any other culture, and what do they tend to highlight? They tend to highlight the victories, the triumphs, the ways that these, these characters have been successful, but only the Bible shows us the good and the bad. The victories and the, and the trials and the struggles of, it, of its characters. So I'm going, we're in good company. We're in good company when it comes to the word. And, and up to this point, we've looked at a, this guy named Noah. And it seems like Noah could do no wrong, right? We've, we've talked about Noah for weeks. And he's, he's known as a, a, a guy who walked with God. He's known as this preacher of righteousness. He, he obeys God whenever God calls him to do something. And we're sitting there going, man, this guy is stellar. And then all of a sudden today, I get to break the bad news to you. He fails. He fails. But there are so many wonderful lessons we can learn from Noah's failure that I think will encourage us. But even also, the way his children respond to his failure are going to teach us a lot. So look at Genesis 9. Let's look at the passage. And how does Noah fail? Well, he gets drunk. So here's this guy who's riding this wave of righteousness, and he decides one night just to, to drink a little too much wine. Not that any of you could ever identify maybe with that, but let, let's just try to kind of understand the, 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 the narrative here. So verse 18 says this, Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. So it's interesting that the, the writer Moses, who's writing to the people of Israel, has something in mind in what he wants to communicate in this, this account. And we're, we're to understand that it has to do with the sons of Noah. And there's three of them, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now notice what's isolated is the child of Ham, so the grandson of Noah, whose name is Canaan. Look at verse 19. And these were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. So we're to understand that these three tribes, these three people groups, really form... The, the entire population of the world, even to this day. And we're going to unpack that more next week of what that means. Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. I mean, who doesn't like grape juice? And who doesn't like fermented grape juice, right? We're going to get out there and we're going to plant a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and became drunk and got naked inside his tent. This was a party of one and Noah was excited to be a part of this party, right? He, he's drunk, and he decides, I'm going to rip off my clothes and take off our clothes. You know, in the tent, there's like a little disco ball inside or something. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, Ham, his son, the father of Canaan, notice how the writer isolates Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his dad and went out and told his brothers outside. We are to understand that this is not a telling of concern. This is a telling of mockery and ridicule. 
Look at verse 23. But Shem and Japheth, the other two sons, took a garment, laid it upon both of their shoulders, and walked backward into the tent, covering the nakedness of their father, and their faces were turned away so that they did not even see their father's nakedness. And when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Not Ham. I mean, Ham was the one that saw the dad, right? And did something that was not proper. But yet, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. And he also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived 350 years after the flood, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Not necessarily the way you want to maybe end your life, right? I mean, you have this track record of just, man, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching righteousness, I'm walking with God, I'm obeying God, and it just goes to show you sometimes great men and women of faith don't always finish well, right? I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, you know what, all of us maybe have some rocky and rough starts, but I'm going to persevere and I'm going to encourage you to persevere. I want us to finish well. I want us to run the race. I want us to fight the fight. I want us to finish well, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Matter of fact, there's several characters throughout Scripture. Even Solomon, the richest, wisest of, of men in the Old Testament, finished his days sacrificing his own children to a foreign god. Good job, Solomon. Where does wealth and wisdom get you? Well, when you get your si eyes off of God, it gets you to sacrificing your own children for, to foreign gods. I want you to finish well. And by finishing well, that means we've got to learn from our fail failures, but we also have to understand what is it that God allows us to triumph in life. So look in your notes. Here we go. Let's look at this passage. Let's take it apart. Obviously, this is some years, sometime after the floods ended because you not only need to plant a vineyard, you need to allow that vineyard to come to fruition, to bear fruit. Sometimes that doesn't always happen immediately. And then the grape juice that's, that's yielded from the grapes from the, the vineyard need time to ferment. So this is obviously some amount of time after the flood. And Noah knows what he's doing. He's a farmer. He's a tiller of the soil. And now this track record of this man who's obeyed God and he's done so well, he now ends up drunk and naked in his tent. So what is the failure of Noah? It is a lack of self-control. And a lack of self-control is something that can hit every single one of us in this room. It is one of the fruit of the Spirit. It is one of the, the virtues that we highlight as a church that we need to understand that self-control is part and parcel of our journey with Jesus. That there is this, there's this struggle, there's these enticements, there's these temptations out there that if we don't exercise wisdom and a dependency upon God, that any one of us can sin and realize that every one of us does sin. And so... What I love is that Spurgeon said this, God never allows his children to sin successfully. See, what we have to understand is that we need to learn from our mistakes and our poor choices. This is a moment of disgrace for Noah. And yet, what we have to understand is that past success does not provide power for future victory. Just because you've walked with God for so many years, there is never a point in your walk with Christ where you sit there and go, you know what, I had some good years. I'm just going to throw my life on cruise control. And we're just going to coast on out of here. Can I tell you, as I've been mentored with old, by older men in my life, I'm currently mentored by a guy, I call him the old sheepdog. He's 85 years old. And he is so truthful and forthright to tell me, just when you think you walk with God for a number of years, you think life gets easier and the temptations get easier, they don't. This is from an 85-year-old man who says to me, you still have to exercise incredible dependence upon God. And so Noah, even at the, towards the end of his life, you know, we need to look at his life and go, what do we need to learn from him? And be reminded that God does allow us to be forgiven. He does extend to us grace. Someone once said, the victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. How many of you had a new beginning yesterday? 
How many of you have, have, are going to have a new beginning today? I have a feeling, you know why? Because we're going to talk about alcohol. Let's talk about alcohol. See, we need to understand something about alcohol. That the Bible talks favorably about alcohol. I know. All my Baptist ancestors are rolling in their graves right now. <laughs> the Bible says alcohol gladdens the heart. Alcohol brings forth great joy. Sometimes alcohol is almost used in a medicinal sense. It's good for the stomach. It helps in digestion. So the Bible speaks favorably of alcohol, but also we need to understand that the Bible also warns of its dangers. That alcohol is one of those things that can be used for good and it can be used for evil. And there's people in this room who, who understand the dangers of alcohol. And there's people who have journeyed through battling alcoholism and seen their families destroyed by it. And so we don't want to treat this su subject lightly and just be like, you know, you have the freedom to drink. We need to understand that with alcohol lies incredible potential for danger and damage. And I'm going to be the guy that goes, you know what, the Bible says... Use it in moderation. If you're going to use it, use it in moderation. That's a huge word. Write that word down, moderation. And not only pertain to alcohol, pertain to a lot of different things, right? We need to be a little bit more moderate when it comes to our, our moral and ethical approaches. But we also need to understand what the Bible says. Is it says, do not get drunk. Because what does alcohol do? Alcohol is not a stimulant. It is something that allows the, 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 the moral attentiveness, uh, your, 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 your uh, uh, thought life to be inhibited a little bit. It, it just it relaxes you, but it also allows you too, to not be able to think clearly. It, it's, it has this numbing effect. That's why in Ephesians chapter 5, write this passage down. It says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Not distilled spirits, the Holy Spirit. All right, let's be clear about this. Some of you are looking for that little, like, door, like, the building says spirits, like, I'm going, and I'm going to be filled with the Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit, not distilled spirits, all right? Why? Because even Paul, 2,000 years ago, understood that of anything that is required of the, of the believer is to be alert spiritually. And anything that deadens your alertness is not good. Does that mean there's not a time to maybe have a, a beer or a glass of wine? No, I'm not saying that. But in moderation, in moderation. Obviously, Noah wasn't moderate because what the Bible says, you can look at Lamentations uh, chapter 4, look at Habakkuk chapter 2 if you want some easy reading this week. It talks about how sometimes drunkenness and nakedness go hand in hand. Right? It's like, why is it that the human mind, all of a sudden, when it gets a little tipsy, thinks like, let's just shed our clothes, right? Like, no one wants to see this. Which, which reveals something else about us in that God has designed the human body to be looked upon in its naked form in a certain context. That we are to show one another respect and not to use or exploit someone else's body for our own gratification. So you see, there's multiple things going on here with Noah's drunkenness. Not only do we not like the fact that he's drunk, but we also don't like the fact that Noah's naked. And he's 600 plus years old. So I don't, I don't even know what that looks like. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, okay. So, so what, yeah. I don't know what kind of visual I created for you, but... That's between you and God, all right? Two things we need to understand about, about drinking. Number one, it degrades our humanity. When you drink, you cease to be human and more like an animal. See, drunkenness brings disgrace. Because we lose control of normal inhibitions and we do things we wouldn't think about as a human being. We have become almost like animals. And so we need to be careful because drinking degrades our humanity. But also, too, drinking destroys our testimony. 
And this is an aspect of drinking we really need to seriously consider because, I mean, there's already a lot out there that's going against the testimony of us as believers in Christ. Let's just not add to it, right? Like, I watched the news a couple weeks ago. No, no joke. This is awesome. Well, it was awesome, but sad at the same time. I'm watching the news, and there's this guy that was robbing the Circle K in Glendale. Why, do, why does all this stuff happen in Glendale? I don't know. If anyone's from Glendale, I love you guys still. But he was in Glendale. He was robbing a Circle K. They got the footage, right? This guy walks into a Circle K, right? They've got the footage, and they said, if you know who this person is, uh, notify, you know, silent witness, blah, blah, blah. But you'll notice, and this is what the newscaster said, he's wearing a very specific shirt. Because on his shirt, in giant letters, John 3.16. You can't make this stuff up! And I'm sitting there going, fool! Right? Like, you're making now even the heathens, those who don't believe in God, make it even harder for them to believe in God. Because even the pagan non-believer knows what John 3.16 is, right? Thanks to Banner Man at all the games, right? You're going to rob a bank with a John 3.16 shirt on? See, we need to think about that. Our behaviors, our actions, our decisions do impact our testimony. And sometimes the things we do that are not honoring to God destroy our testimony. Can, can I just get really ultra serious real fast on you? My own grandfather who died an atheist, rebellious to the end against Christ, would always come back to one incident in his life as a child where he saw his uncles go to church on a Sunday morning, and that was how they started their day. And how they ended their day were so stinking drunk that they were pissing on themselves right there in his own bedroom. And my grandfather probably told me that story, no joke, a hundred times. Because in his mind, he's going, here are men who say they love Jesus and certainly prove through their actions and behaviors on Sunday morning that they love the Lord. And yet they finish that very day so stinking drunk, pissing all over themselves. What does that do to an eight-year-old little boy's mind? And I sit there and go, those uncles, men I never knew who were of my lineage, I never knew those guys, but they ruined the testimony of Christ because of a lack of self-control. Think about what you do. Yes, all things are lawful. But not all things are profitable. This is not about you. This is about your testimony with others. And your greatest concern shouldn't be, well, I have the freedom to do this. Your greatest concern should be, how will what I'm doing affect this person and them loving Jesus more? Yes, you can do whatever you want but that doesn't mean you're justified in your decisions. And especially when it comes to drinking, because there's so many people in our presence that have been so horribly damaged by it. Whether drinking directly or indirectly through a a family, they see their own parents divorced because of alcohol. They've seen a best friend lose their life because of an alcohol-related car accident. Who knows? But all I know is that we should be aware and sensitive to those around us, because I'm doing that. I'm trying to do that. Boy, if we get invited to someone's house and I know they've got a past with alcohol, they may offer me something. I'm going to go, no, because I don't want my liberty to cause this person to struggle. So I am cautious in talking about this because I do have a beer once in a while. But the one thing I don't want to ever do is end up naked in a tent because of my liberty. Yeah, thank you, Lord. (laughs) Talk about an image, right? No, we're not going there, right? So, so am I clear on that? You guys, be careful what you post. I don't care, you know. Some, some of you post pictures on, on social media, and I would say if I was looking at your love for Jesus or your love for alcohol, boy, you have a love affair with wine, beer. Every picture, there you are. I mean, what, what would you think if all of a sudden every picture of your pastor was him, you know, with an alcoholic beverage? 
you know, Pastor Scotch. I mean, Sp Pastor Scott. <laughs> I, I, I drink, but I drink moderately. And I want people to know more than what beer I'm enjoying. I want people to know that my life is sold out not to alcohol. My life is sold out to Christ. And I would gladly give that up for the sake of someone knowing Jesus more. Be careful. Don't use your liberty in Christ as a license to do something that will not allow you to be in control of your actions, your behaviors, your attitudes. Am I clear on that, honey? Yeah. You, you, you let out some utterance earlier. I was wondering what was going on over there. Okay, preacher. Okay, cool. We'll keep going. All right. Uh, the failure of Ham. Next point. So, so here's, here's the situation, right? Noah sins one thing, but what his son does is another. And this is a re great reminder to us that sometimes our sin can result in greater sin with somebody else. That, that's a, that is a haunting, sobering reality. That what I choose to do, if, if it is something that is not to the honor and glory of God, that could begin a snowball effect of someone making a choice based upon my choice that even is worse. Because that's what the author wants us to look at. What does Ham do? What is his failure? His failure is a lack of moral decency. It's a lack of moral decency. I mean, here is a, here's a thing that's going on in Ham's heart. Let's just, here, two things. Number one, total dishonor towards his dad. And number two, a callousness towards sin. Those are not your blanks. Don't worry. I'm just, I'm just painting a context. For some of you are like, where, where is that? Where is he? Here's the reality to you guys. Ever since we started Genesis, and just so you guys know, the good news is we're almost done, like two or three more weeks in Genesis. But you've seen how God created the world. He sets up humanity. And all of a sudden, there's been struggle in divinely given relationships. There's a struggle between Adam and Eve. So there's struggle in marriage. There's struggle between siblings, Cain and Abel. There's struggle between humanity, Genesis 6. Men, women killing each other because they're so wicked inside that they're violent towards one another. So now there has to be government set up where capital punishment is now of the law of the lamb, land. So you see the struggle. Now there's struggle between a child and a parent. So you see how the, the seed of the serpent wants to get in there and destroy divinely given design to our society. And how does the serpent get in and influence at this time? It basically motivates Ham to show dishonor to his own father. And that's the first point in your, in your notes. Dishonor to a position of authority. The Bible says this, honor your father and mother. Commandment number five. And why does it say honor your father and mother? Because this is what's best for society. And when you honor your father and mother, you shall live long in the land. And Paul, even in uh, Ephesians chapter six, highlights this. So we got Old Testament, New Testament in connection with each other. Honor your parents. And honoring your parents, ladies and gentlemen, is not based upon how well they did as parents. Some of you are saying, I can't honor. No, 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 no. It's not what God says. There's no exception clause. My father was a big jerk. No, nope, that doesn't say that. My mom was a selfish nilly. I don't know, whatever. So it says, honor your father simply because of their position of authority that God has graced them with. It's not based upon performance. It's based upon position. Just like the president of the United States. I don't care what you think about the president. What I do know is if you're a follower of Christ, you pray for the president. Because that position is worthy of honor and respect. Ham dishonors his father. He takes perverse pleasure in exposing his father's folly to his brothers. He's that guy that goes in and he goes, Whoa! Shem, Japheth, you guys got to come check this out. And he wants to turn his father's failure into this moment of, of folly and laughter. And 
this is totally dishonorable, not only to Noah, but to God. We never make light of someone else's sins. We never treat someone else's struggles as an opportunity for laughter. His action mocked and ridiculed the very dad he should have been respecting, and he wasn't. And so how people respond to the embarrassment of others tells me a lot about your character. Let me say that again. How you respond to someone else's embarrassing moment or their, their moment of failure is an indication of your character. That we should be concerned about what we laugh at, what we make fun of, what we ridicule. There are people that peddle in this stuff. There's like, TMZ, TMZ wouldn't be around if it didn't love to glorify other people's failures. And there's some of you that watch this. And I sit there and go, you know what? Whatever is ridiculing or mocking somebody else, we ought to do away with. And especially when it comes to our parents, because respect for parents, even sinful parents, is at the core of a well structured society the moment kids start disrespecting their parents is the moment that society's just beginning to crumble and parents let me say a word to you because i'm one of them all right stop trying to be your kid's friend and be their parent and i'm gonna too many of you are like you know what? i just love hanging out we're just chummy chummy no 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 you're supposed to be their authority figure and i think it was the the late great robin williams i miss that guy he said this you can either choose when your kids will hate you, because they will hate you. You can either choose to have them hate you early on in their lives, because if you don't choose then, they're going to hate you later on. Truth. The other thing that concerns me about Ham is his desensitized attitude towards the presence of sin. Desensitized. We do not stumble upon moments of of the presence of sin and not be moved by it in a sense where okay what sort of ethical purity needs to be applied to this versus ham embracing a spirit of moral abandonment we 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 don't trivialize sin We don't traffic in sin. We don't treat sin lightly. Early on in Genesis, when Cain murdered Abel, God said something to to, to Cain's heart and said this, sin is crouching at your door. Meaning, the moment you don't take sin seriously is the moment that very hideous, heinous beast is ready to stomp all over your heart. And we need to get radical. Radical. I mean, I remember a time I went down to Mexico. So I was in Mexico with my youth group. This is when I was called to ministry, 15 years old. And uh, we were working, building a camp in Mexico for the the nationals down there to have like a retreat center they could go to. So bring in the American teenagers, right? Let them do all the the sweaty work, right? And there was a a job that no one wanted to take, and that was expanding the sewer line from the camp. And so me, Lester, Todd, and Matt— the four of us, we were into new order, we were into girls, and we were into the worst job. Like, we were the guys that was like, give us the w- most rotten job. And they said, here it is. They gave us shovels, they sent us down this hill, and literally there was this pipe coming out the dirt, and it was just pumping crap. And seriously, we got, we jumped in this pit of the rankest, smelliest it was i mean we we were we were like and literally for like two hours but you know what happened after two hours there was no more gagging we were singing we were shoveling yeah we were just there were rats running all over and at the end of the day when that that day's work was done they buried me up to my neck in it and there were rats coming up to me and they were like And you know what? I didn't care. I didn't care. They're snapping pictures, right? On the old Polaroids, you know, back in the day. Yeah, you know, they're snapping pictures. And all of a sudden, now that moment turned into a lifelong spiritual lesson. That when you immerse yourself in the crap long enough, you no longer recognize it as crap. Tweet tweet that. That, That's going to be a good one. That's going to be a good one. 
some of us, <laughs> I have that picture. I want to find that picture just to show you guys. That, it, it just is, a, it, if you continue to surround yourself with the, the filth of the world, the things that are just so dishonorable to God, you will grow desensitized to it. You, you will embrace it. You will celebrate it. You'll traffic in it, and you will not think anything differently because of it. And I sit there and go, may our hearts never come to a place like that. Where Ham no longer recognized this moment of failure on his father's part, and, and be broken by it and try to do something better about it, but instead he wanted to traffic in it. And I just sit there and go, sad for us because sin is crouching at our door. And if we continue to wallow and swim and surround ourselves with sin, the more we'll be desensitized to it, which ultimately has a third effect, and this is this, the destiny for the progeny of unrighteousness. Progeny. That's a good word right there. Is the only P word I can think of. So, notice the curse is not on Ham. The curse is on Canaan, Ham's son. Ham has four boys. The youngest is Canaan. And what we have to understand is that God says to, 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 to Ham through Noah, your lineage will now feel the effects of your moral abandonment. See, what starts off in a seed form will eventually, down through history, grow into a forest of unrighteousness. What started out as a little trickle will eventually become a flood of unrighteousness. See, what we have to understand is that Ralph Waldo Emerson nailed this when he said these words. Listen, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. You reap a habit, you're going to reap a character. You sow a character and you reap a destiny. The small things you do now that you think are so trivial and small and insignificant have great ramifications down the road. And don't be so fooled to think that you always reap in the same season you sow. The Bible says sometimes the sins of the father are carried on to the third and fourth generation. What you do now matters for your legacy that you're going to leave behind. What you treat right now lightly and trivially and what you trifle with will maybe result in a big, heinous, hideous monster down the road when it comes to your kids and their kids and their kids. <laughs> this is why this is important. Moses is writing these words to tell the people of Israel, do not play with sin. Don't minimize someone else's struggles and their weaknesses. This is why he curses Ham's son, Canaan. Because not only the sins of the father being passed on. Now, I'm not going to tell you right now. So many people have asked me about the sins of the, the father, right? Being passed on to the third and fourth, fourth generation as if there's some unbreakable curse. Any curse can be broken by Christ. Come on, guys. Let, let's just put our theology caps on. Any, any curse can be broken by Christ. Every generation is, is responsible for their own actions. But... Foolish are we to think that we can set up the next generation to do well if we don't establish a solid, solid baseline of theology about Jesus Christ in their lives. What our, our kids see us doing today will have much more of a, of a reaping effect down the road that we have no idea what, what could happen. And then their kids. So I'm going to tell you right now, stop. <laughs> Point your kids to Jesus. It is, it, there's no better time than the present to start doing what's right and living for the glory of God, amen? And number two, the thing we need to think about too is that what we reap, we will sow. The Bible's clear on this. Galatians talks about this. What is happening with Noah and Ham and that whole incident will have deeper ramifications to come. And thirdly, what we need to understand is that God could have cursed all three of Ham's, uh, four of Ham's kids, but he only chooses to, to curse one. And it's a group called the Canaanites, if you know anything about the Bible, the Canaanites are the poster children of unrighteousness. You want to write down a really, really interesting chapter and read it later? Leviticus chapter 18. It lists all the perversions and all the horrible practices of the, of the Canaanites. 
and the Canaanites were the, the parents of the, the, uh, the Harazites and the Jebusites and the, and the Amorites and the Mosquito Bites and all those groups of tribes out there. I mean, these are, these are bad people. And the Canaanites were the ones that God said, you need to do away with them because if you don't do away with them, they will compromise. You will compromise your character. I.e., Israel, don't play with the Canaanites because you are not going to fare well if you do that. And I wonder what we do in our lives that's compromising our character in Christ. What are you doing that's compromising your character in Christ that is causing more moral bankruptcy than moral health? Well, let me stop there because we've trafficked in this stuff enough. Let me set you up with some lessons for triumph, okay? I want you guys to do well. I want to do well. So here's some truths and encouragement for living above our failures, learning from our mistakes. You ready for this? Number one, there's the triumph of the brothers. Shem and Japheth, all of a sudden here's their brother running to them. And Ham is just excited to just traffic in, in Noah's failure. And what does Shem and Japheth do? They, they don't want to have any part of it. And so much so that they take a, a, a blanket, <laughs> they put on their shoulders, and they walk backwards. Like, these guys are so careful to avoid any appearance of sin, any dabbling in it whatsoever. They walk backwards and like, you know, throw the, the blanket over, of no, and they don't even want to look. I mean, think about the steps required to, to not even expose themselves to something that would be so dishonorable to their dad. And this tells me the reason those brothers triumphed at this moment is because they took sin seriously, but what they took more seriously was the pursuit of holiness in their lives. See, the question for them wasn't, how close to sin can we dance and not get harmed? That wasn't their question. Their question was, how far away from sin can we stand and still remain pure and holy? Amen. I remember having a college conversation with some, some dorm mates, okay? So these, these roommates, there were like 16 of us in this, not one room, but a shared quad of, of rooms. And the discussion when we're 18 years old for, at Bible college, mind you, was this. How far can you go with a girl physically and not sin? Like that was the topic. And, and I was the guy that ruined the whole conversation. Because there's this one guy, this one 18-year-old dude, like, just Mexican dude, big dude, you know. He's like, dude, I can be totally naked with this girl and, and not even think about sin. I'm like, man, that guy's got more than I do, for sure. And I said, guys, maybe we're asking the wrong question. Not how far can we go without sinning. How far can we stay away and remain pure and honorable to the Lord? No one wanted me as a roommate next semester. <laughs> Oh, there's Scott preaching righteousness. Well, like, what? Really, are we to live our lives thinking how far close to the edge of the line do we dance when it comes to sin? Or are we saying, I don't even trust myself. Corinthians, take heed, lest you too fall. I think we have, we think of ourselves more highly than we should. Okay, there's the line. The question is not like, oh, oh look at me. No, no, there's the line. I'm going... I'm staying away. Because anything that's going to lead me to a, a lack of self-control, I'm going to avoid. Do you, you guys get what I'm saying? Like, it's not how far to the line do we dance and dabble, how far do we avoid it and just stay clear of it. That's what honors God. This is what the message of, of what we're trying to get at is, is preaching to us. So what does that mean for us? It means that we can't cleanse sin, only Jesus can do that. Amen? We don't condone sin because God wants the very best of our lives. He wants us to walk in holiness. So what do we do? It says this, the Bible says, love covers a multitude of sin. That's exactly what those brothers did with their father. They covered his sin. And that's what we do with each other. We cover the sin just like God has covered our sin in Christ and he has clothed us in the right robes of righteousness that Jesus got for us. Isn't that awesome? And then God still treats us lovingly and delicately, but he tells us that I've covered your sins and I want you down to walk in righteousness. 
So here's the triumph for the believer. Three things I want to close out on. That these things are so important for our, our daily jir- journey. Can I, I, and I just really want to uh, back up real quick because we had some Proverbs. I wanted to show you guys. Write these down fast because these are wonderful phrases. So, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Meaning when someone stumbles, cover it up with love. Don't celebrate it. Next proverb is this. The vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. What's the next proverb? It says this. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Meaning you don't tell someone about someone else's fall, you cover it up in love. Because when you traffic in someone else's failures, it ruins relationships. What about these next verses? Galatians chapter 6. What is the, we're called to do as a church? Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch of yourselves, lest you too be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, this is the spirit that was in these brothers. What's the next verse? Uh, Psalm 32. Look at this. The, blessed is the one whose transgression, transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Which leads us to the triumph of the believer. Three things. The importance of position, the importance of purity, and the importance of perseverance. We're going to go out with a bang on this one, all right? You guys ready? We can live differently. Okay? We are called by Christ to be counter-cultural. To be in the world, but not of the world. You're here. And people are going to look at you like, who are you? And that's what happens when when Jesus came on the scene. If we're going to be little Christ, then it's going to be a very similar thing. Like, we're going to represent something the world is not used to. And where does that start? Number one, your position. Think about this, your identity in Christ. Our triumph ultimately is rooted in Christ's triumph. If he has been risen, we've been risen. Amen? If he has triumphed, we have triumphed. And so don't forget about your position. In Christ, if you're his, you're given all the resources needed to live the Christian life. There's no one here who has Jesus that says, I can't live that life. Let's change the word can't to the word won't. That's that's the reality of it. If we have been given the very spirit of Christ and all of it to dwell within us, then all of the resources, all of the riches, all of the blessings that Christ has are now ours because we're his kids. So don't tell me you can't. The real issue is you won't. And now it's an issue of love. What do you love more? Which brings us to our second point, the importance of purity. You might want to write the word holiness the bible says this old testament and new testament can't can't excuse it away be holy the lord says as i am holy holiness is such a central attribute of god notice it doesn't say the angels are singing mercy 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 is the lord god almighty grace 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 is the lord What do the angels sing? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holiness is the central attribute that impacts all the other attributes of God. And now he says to us, be holy as I'm holy. We're sitting there going, are you kidding me? How do I do that? Well, back to your position. You do it because you have all the resources now in you. So now it's called to live a life of purity. You are to be set apart from the world. That's holiness. You're to be different. Unless you want some biblical examples, here we go. Ready? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says this. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Too many of us are feeding the desires of the flesh. That is a dead-end street right there. But walk by the Spirit. Depend upon the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, Paul says these words. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Wow, that, that... He doesn't mince words there, does he? But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The old saints from 400 years ago used a word that I would, I would love to see us use again and just have people go, what are you talking about? Mortification. Put to death. Don't play with it. Don't invite it into your house. Don't coddle or cuddle it. 
Don't encourage it. Whatever is of sin, Paul says, put to death. Sever. Strangle. Choke. Stab. Shoot. Whatever. Put it to death and you will live. But too many of us are not putting the deeds of the flesh to death. We are not mortifying ourselves, dying to ourselves, and killing those things that are causing us to die. And we wonder why we're so lifeless and spiritless. Because you'd rather watch five hours of The Orange is the New Black instead of watching five hours of The Book of Lamentations. I know it's not a fun trade-off. But what we're not talking about is fun. We're talking about life. What we choose to pursue reveals a lot about the things we love. We're not talking about behaviors. We're talking about affection. You could say you love Christ, but your behavior sometimes... What's the word? They deceive you. We, I mean, we're all sitting in church right now. We must all love Jesus. Not necessarily. We could put a good show on for an hour and a half. Or if Scott really gets long, we did an hour and 40 minutes. We can, we can put on that Jesus face and be like, oh yeah, hallelujah. And then we live the rest of our lives like hell and we think we're good. You guys, you demand holiness from me. Because you don't want to read about me in the paper tomorrow. You don't want to see my face on the news on Tuesday. Another pastor has fallen morally. Another pastor has made mistakes. Another pastor has, you know, because the world would love to traffic, especially when believers fail and falter. You demand holiness from me. Why? Probably because my position maybe demands it. But we are all followers of Jesus Christ. We are all sheep under one great shepherd's voice. I'm going to call us all to a higher level of accountability. Don't play games with sin. No wonder our marriages are train wrecks and our kids are horrible and our jobs are so so many unethical things going on there. Because why? Because we would rather be friends with the world than be friends of Christ. Can I I preach right now? James chapter 4. Oh, you adulteresses. How's that for an opening of a a section? You choose to love the world more than you love Christ. And we think we're going to do okay with that. Your walk of purity is important. Hebrews chapter 12. Look what it says. Strive for peace with everyone and for the for with the holiness for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If we do not pursue holiness, you will not see the Lord. What a, what a sobering and humbling thought that is. Can I tell you when holiness happens? You ready for this? Holiness happens when you're most satisfied in God. And can I tell you right now, that whole satisfaction thing. Sometimes holiness is not fun. And, and I'm not going to preach to you a, a happy, like, Christianity. You want to be happy? Follow Jesus. Because all I know is what Jesus demands sometimes does not come across as happy. But what we don't realize is that what Jesus is getting at is transforming our hearts, which sometimes is hard. But the result of holiness is ultimately happiness. Where we learn, like the psalmist says, and your, in your right hand, O God, are pleasures forevermore. Which brings us to the last point, the importance of perseverance. You have to fight. You have to fight. Let me just tell you, this is easy. Two hours from now is when the battle's going to happen. Tomorrow morning's when the battle's going to happen. Tuesday night's when the battle's going to happen. This is easy. I'm just basically in the, it's halftime, and we're in the locker room. And I'm going, team, there's a brutal enemy out there. And you've got to fight and you've got to persevere. Because we know who wins the war. Amen? But it's the little battles and skirmishes that we still need to be faithful in. Can I encourage you to perseverance? Psalms 16, verse 11. Here it is. 
You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And you got to believe that the, the psalmist fought for this. He persevered in this. This is not behavior modification. I'm not talking about living in a state of denial. I am talking about living in a state of delight. Quit denying and abstaining from defiling thoughts and motivations and behaviors. True holiness is a state of delight that you're saying, I want God more than I want X. Because X does not satisfy like Christ satisfies. Here's what the gospel tells me, that I'm loved more than I ever imagined, and I'm accept more than I'd ever realized, and that God has given me this great gift of love that nothing in this world could ever afford me. So what I'm talking about is not avoidance, I'm talking about perseverance. Too many Christians learn this, this life of discipleship by, oh, just avoid this and avoid that. You know what? When you persevere towards Jesus, you will avoid this stuff. That's the byproduct of pursuing Christ persevere. And fundamentally, this is a heart issue. It's about affection, not behavior. Romans chapter 12. One of the first verses I memorized as a believer in Christ. I appeal there to you, brethren, by, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Who thinks sacrificing themselves is fun? You present yourself holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. But how? By the renewing of your mind. How does the renewing of your mind happen? It requires perseverance. That by testing that, you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. One thing I know about living in Arizona, that you don't have to do anything for weeds to grow in your yard. But what you have to do in order to plant something beautiful is that you have to persevere and be diligent in that. Weeds will grow in and of themselves. It's the flowers that require hard work. It's not much different about holiness, you guys. If you just let your spiritual life go, the weeds will grow. But if you persevere and grow those flowers of Christ, oh, look out. It's good. Let me close with this verse. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the seat or the counsel of the wicked or sin in the way of the sinners or sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight... His affections from the heart are in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates. How often? Day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons, and the leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Who wants that for their lives? Me. But it requires discipline. It requires perseverance. Can I tell you, when we're done with Genesis in a couple of weeks, guess what we're going to talk about? Spiritual disciplines. I as a pastor feel like you need to be equipped and mobilized to start putting best practices in play in your lives so that you can live lives for the glory and honor of God. Amen? So that's what's coming up. A little preview, a little taste, a little appetizer. I hope I haven't yelled at you guys too much today. Maybe again, maybe I, I do not apologize for that. I like yelling at you guys because we need to be yelled. I yell at myself, you know? Because what Christ has done for us demands that we live lives differently for his glory. Amen? Praise God for his son given to us for life and light and holiness. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these men and women. I love and I adore and I appreciate so much. Uh, Lord, we know that, that, that the battle, the struggle is not only outside of this place, but it even resides within our own hearts. Remind us that our failures are never final or fatal or fearful. That you're a God who restores and heals like none other. So today, Father, begin the healing work through your spirit. Guide us in the right path. Help us by your spirit to put the de death, the deeds of the flesh, and help us to be mind, have minds and hearts that are awakened by the spirit. Help us to desire Christ and not desire anything else. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day. See you soon. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.